I, I'm going to speak as an employer and as a working woman. How many people in the room have got people working for them today or work in HR? Great. How many people want people working for them tomorrow? Some of you don't want anyone working for you. <laughs> okay. I, we are employers and it's incredibly important or we're part of an organisation and it's really important that the whole organisation looks after people and we're the best place to work. Now, a couple of caveats before I start. P&G is a client, and I honestly think it's much, much easier being a client. We're not in the business of serving and delighting people. And also, we're not London-based. Uh, so our office is Weybridge in Surrey. I live a mile from the office. I picked a school two miles from the office when we had number three. I drew a circle around the office of two miles, and, and we moved there, because it's much, much easier to juggle a job and kids if they're really, really close together. Uh, and I schedule. I've got an itinerary seven days a week. I have one-on-ones with all my direct reports, and I have one-on-ones with my children. I, I've got action plans with my direct reports. I've got action plans with my children. But it's a two-way action plan, so my direct report tell me what coaching and help they need and my kids tell me what coaching and help they need and we have a contract so if I say I'm going to be at sports day I'm there if we agree I don't need to be at sports day I'm not I uh, kind of Juliet's finishing little school she had eight events and uh, my school in Glasgow certainly did not have uh, eight events from a school prom to a graduation so we sat down with the schedule and the 11 year old got out the schedule and I said what do you want me to be at and she picked them and we agreed and we put it in the diary together and we've got a big family calendar which is now kind of online uh, where we can add and delete things but planning is incredibly important and for those of you who don't have kids you know this sounds monstrous uh, but things don't happen spontaneously and you do have to plan things and you also absolutely have to say no you have to say no to other people and you have to say no to yourself and sometimes you've got to say no to your little kids I, but I, I've been on the board of PNG for 19 years and it's changed a lot and I think I've helped drive that change because when I became a board member 19 years ago when I was in a UK board I was the only woman and the rest of the board were men and it felt like a very very strange place to be the same as when I started work with PNG we were a class of 14 graduates there were 12 blokes and there was one other woman who was very like the blokes uh, she understood cricket and rugby and she could drink the blokes under the table and then there was me and apart from being we were all quite kind of geekish at that time PNG recruited you know brilliant economists mathematicians you know people who had really great thinking whereas at Unilever were recruiting people you'd actually want to have at a party who were really kind of fun people but they were quite so the PNG class were quite like me I was an economist but uh, but they were blokes and they had a very very different opinion and when I got on the board, I realised that our mission really to drive the business uh, was to understand our consumers. And it was really difficult to do that because most of our consumers are women. Even on the male products at Head and & Shoulders and Gillette, they tend to be bought by women, uh, either chosen by women or kind of purchased by women. And it's incredibly important that we understand our consumers to give us that competitive edge. Now, we're in the creative business but we're also in business, and business is really, really important. It's about driving, building the business, and also building people. And there I was in a business which was run by men, uh, and I think that was giving us a huge competitive disadvantage. It also wasn't a great place to be. Board meetings were not a great place to be. So uh, they gave me the job of diversity because the HR director was a man at that point, and I looked at what could we do to get more women on board. And we could have done three things. We could just have ignored it and waited for people naturally to rise to the top. People said it'll be another kind of five, seven years. You've got great people coming through. We could do what some other countries had done, which was positively discriminate, you know, find uh, great women, put them in special fast track programs and promote them. Uh, or we could understand why women were not in senior positions and address the barriers. And that's what I did. Uh, we talked to a lot of women and we looked at what were the key barriers and we put together a strategy which was all about recruiting the best men or women, developing the best men and women and retaining the best men and women. But listening to women, we found there were some really, really big barriers for women. So we put at that time some strategies in place. We've revisited them since. But they're things that I think make us a very, very good employer of women and a very, very good employer of people. Uh, leadership comes from the top. So at that point, my GM was measured on kind of uh, promoting uh, women, having a good place for women to work and having no diversity based reason for anybody leaving the business. We set targets together and we tracked those because in business, I think you get what you measure. 
We had role models, but we made sure they were accessible role models, and we had mentoring up and mentoring down. Uh, so I was mentored by kind of a bloke working for me. Women were mentoring up, women, women were mentoring down. Everybody had, had mentors of different genders above them and below them. And then we had a lot of buddying systems where people had peers that they could talk to about gender issues. We looked at absolutely focusing on results because talking to women, and this was 19 years ago, people said they had to be present. In fact, some people were doing what they still do in the city. You know, they would leave their jacket and their extra handbag under their desk and, you know, drive home, you know, go to the pub, you know, and then come back. So they could be seen to be first in the office and seen to be last out. People were really concerned about style. People were really, really concerned. So we changed the way that we were assessing and promoting people and we looked at results. So it didn't matter what hours you worked, it didn't matter what your style was you were measured and what difference did you make to the business. We did look at flex work options and I think Kathleen's absolutely right. It won't work in every single job. We tried job shares, didn't really work. So what we've done is we've divided some jobs into smaller jobs and, uh, and we've got lots of flex work options today. So you can uh, work flexibly, you can work in the office, you can work at home, you can work part-time work. My PA does four short days, takes her kids to school, kind of picks the kids up at the end of the day. We've got sabbaticals, uh, unpaid sabbaticals, which you can have between assignments. We've got career breaks of two years. And really importantly, we've got returning to work support, because whether you're off for six months or two years, when you come back to work, it's really daunting. And when you come back with a first child, and that first child is sick and the nursery is calling asking you to remove it it's really stressful so we put a lot of return to work programs in place to really help people get back to work with other people who've been through it and the fifth one practical child care 15 years ago we appointed an agency we asked people what they wanted they did not want the png crash We've got the PNG gym, that's very competitive. They didn't want the little baby being in the PNG crash, equally competitive. And they didn't want to drive the little baby kind of 15 miles to work, whether they lived in central London or kind of a Brighton. Uh, they wanted the child to grow up in the community. So what we've got is a childcare agency. Uh, they're currently called My Family Care. They're the fifth owner, so I kind of guess they don't make any money uh, since people keep selling them. But they're based nationally in the UK. In the southeast, they look after 70 companies. A lot of them are financial companies. But what does My Family Care do? Well, it does what women told us they wanted. It helps you assess childcare options. So if you want to look at nurseries, it does reports in every nursery in the southeast. It tells you the strengths, it tells you the weaknesses. You know, it tells you kind of verbatims, people who've loved it and hated it. It gives you the financial spreadsheet. If you want to employ a nanny, how much does it cost? What you're liable for if she's pregnant? What happens? Uh, if you if you want other options, uh, it will help you recruit nannies, help you recruit childminders, interview for you, advertise for you, all paid by P&G. And importantly, it does emergency childcare, uh, which works about 360 days of the year. You know, if it is February and there is a flu epidemic, we can't send a nanny. But most of the time, we can send a nanny to your house when your child is too sick to go to nursery. Your nanny too sick to arrive or something else has gone kind of disastrously wrong and they've got a team of nannies uh, and in recession it's got even better they've got really flexible people who are all kind of police cleared and really reliable people have used it over the years and it really is a fabulous service my family care is also dealing with elderly parents people are now having challenges of their parents going into care the financial <laughs> responsibilities of that and my family care will will meet you sit down look at options with you and your family picking nannies you know it, it deals with kind of you and your partner uh, sometimes it deals with wives when the husband's at work but it really is designing solutions to meet you and your personal needs and the fourth one we've spent a lot of time on is really understanding the differences kind of men and women are different individuals are different everybody's unique and special and they've got different styles and you need to understand those differences and uh, today we've uh, kind of got uh, a board that's 50-50 male-female. We've got women directors leading traditionally male areas that product supply. We've got fantastic African-American women, Monique. Uh, customers absolutely love her because she calls them mom. Uh, you go to Tesco or kind of Boots, but she's just incredible. And, uh, and she's leading a, a team of 300 people in the UK, making sure that our products are where they need to be. We've got a woman leading the sales force of 500 and the board really is truly diverse. But we've spent a lot of time understanding those differences. And on my kind of working journey, I've learned that men and women really are different. If you don't believe that, then just think about shopping. 
kind of, you know, men, it's, you know, kill, uh, you know, set goal, get in and out there as quickly as possible. Women, we go along for the experience. We may have forgotten what we wanted to buy in the first place. I don't know if gender differences are inborn or inbred, even after three daughters, but there are differences. And the best explanation I've seen is an American gender psychologist I worked with when I spent three years working in California, who has studied children in 18 different countries around the world and says they really play different games. So girls in the room, what, what games? Oh, boys in the room, sorry, boy question first. A few boys in the room. What, base, what games did you play growing up? Football. Football? Cricket, yeah, cricket, rugby, what else? War games, absolutely. Uh, and that's, that's true all around the world. You have lines of boys, no eye contact whatsoever uh, until the age of 21. Sometimes that's a challenge for interviewing Kathleen, but there they are, <laughs> kind of, you know, playing team games, playing kind of war games, uh, cops and robbers, all sorts of different things. And meanwhile, what were the girls playing? Dolls and? House. Yes, houses. Lots of domestic games. So we played intensely with one or two friends. And uh, we built great relationships. Uh, we built a kind of a really, really kind of strong collaboration. Uh, we listened, we respected others. You know, we went to the majority, but we didn't lead. In fact, if you led in dolls or houses, you were thrown out the game for being a bossy cow. <laughs> uh, and today, online games mirror this. So boys online are playing war games. They're playing FIFA football, but they're playing the same games. And in the team games, you know if you are the top striker or if you're in the subs bench, you know exactly where you are in the hierarchy. And in cops and robbers kind of war games, half the time you win, half the time you lose but you bounce back and you go on next time. Uh, girls online today are playing things like Stardoll or Club Penguin where they're having their kind of fluffles and building extensions to their igloo so they're replicating the sort of games we, we used to play. But girls don't learn to lose and girls don't know where they are in the hierarchy. So when you start work, you bring these lessons to work and as you started work or people are joining your companies, you'll see women collaborate brilliantly, build relationships, you know, they can interview very well, great in client service. Uh, men uh, can uh, be really kind of uh, great at setting goals, you know, kind of bouncing back from losing the pitch, really, really fabulous. But women are not used to losing and can take that very personally and very emotionally. And men are not used to relationships and sometimes that can feel a bit strange and I think the ideal team needs to be a mixed team so I've worked on three boards that have been all female one was in the uh, uh, fragrance industry that was interesting because the state of California came and audit us, audited us every six months and told us we needed more men uh, it did a gender audit and the company was 89% female and it did a race audit and they had real problems with me I was white other because they had no Scottish box and uh, they had lots of other kind of boxes and I got my action plan from the state of California every six months on, on what to do but I think it's incredibly important an all-female board doesn't work either. I've worked in a couple of industry boards, kind of WACO and Cosmetic Executive Women, which I chair, which is really frustrating, honestly, being in an all-female board. And one of those boards, uh, CW, Nicola was, was part of, uh, we had to change the agenda and we've got 9.45, coffee and handbags, brackets optional. 10 o'clock, the meeting starts and we now charge through the agenda and are out of there in half the time. And it's really important to understand each other uh, and to be honest, in work I now have kind of discovery meetings because women quite like to bounce ideas off each other. We'll have a discovery meeting which doesn't necessarily have a conclusion or we have a power meeting which is quite often 20 minutes, don't even sit down, we've got to make a decision and we've got to do something get out of there because it's a crisis. But we name the meeting so you know if this is a power meeting or a discovery meeting. If I go and chat to my boss, I'll tell him that I'm just bouncing ideas off him or that I want a solution. Uh, my current boss is a finance Filipino guy, and he just thought I was weird. He'd worked in the finance function, there I am, kind of blue sky and kind of ideas and things, and he just thought I was completely bizarre. Uh, so tell your boss, tell people around about you what you're doing, and really invest time in getting to know each other, uh, and then uh, you will have a much better team. Uh, and uh, you absolutely need to love your job. Uh, when you have children, you will passionately and irrationally love your child. Your child is the best child in the whole world. Uh, and so if you're going to leave your child and go to work, you need a job that you love, you need a company that you love, and that company needs to have a mission that you love, and you need to be in a team that you love. And as employers, we need to create that culture, we need to create that mission, and we need to keep closely in touch with all our employees, men and women, to make sure that they really are happy. Because I think happy people deliver outstanding business results. I had a regional president who traveled around the world, came into 
to the office for a couple of hours and he would simply go around, chat to people and then look at the scores of the, the People Satisfaction Index. Never did a business review because his whole philosophy was if the people are happy, the business results will be great. Uh, and they were and he did extremely well. So make sure that you're happy as an individual in the company. If you're not happy, then go find another job or go find another career and make sure that your people and your organisation are the best organisation it can possibly be because you can deliver outstanding business results and attract and, and retain the best talent if you get this right but you need to keep improving and keep getting this right thank you